disappointment. We pray, God, for their strength. We pray that you would build them up, give them hope, give them a sense of God that you are present with them and that you can provide for them whatever they need. God, we humbly ask that you look down upon all of those brothers and sisters who have been dealing with the most devastating aspect of this current world crisis. God, we pray that you would lift their hearts, encourage their spirits, help them, oh God, to feel your divine presence so that they might be lifted up and be encouraged to move on a little further. God, we need you right now in a special way. Then, oh God, we want to thank you for all of those great things that you have done for us. And God, make us mindful that as we put our trust in you, that we can get through any ordeal that faces us in this world. We now bless you. We honor you. We magnify you. In the name of Jesus, amen. My brothers and sisters, we are so glad that you have uh, come to share with us tonight. And tonight we continue with our series that is entitled The Seasonal Change. Uh, tonight's scripture, however, is Psalm 61. It should be 61 verses 1 through 2. This is Lesson 10, and it is entitled, Upward Mobility. Upward Mobility. If you will look at uh, this psalm, it says, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you. When my heart is faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Once again, we have entitled this lesson, Upward Mobility. And the idea of upward mobility usually is associated with economic or uh, social upward mobility. A person will get a promotion on a job, they will uh, get a career change, uh, they will have uh, they will get married into a, a family that they think is uh, of a higher social class. And as people move up, they, they feel as though that they are moving forward in their lives. Some, some of you may remember uh, the old sitcom, uh, The uh, Jeffersons, uh, where the uh, theme song was Moving On Up. Well, that's the general idea of upward mobility. But upward mobility also has a, a spiritual transition. It also means that it can, uh, is also the idea that it can, we can move up forward, up higher uh, in our spiritual lives. And this is what it means. It means that we're moving from uh, such gloomy valleys as hardship, pain, disappointment, and despair. This is where a lot of us find ourselves today. We find ourselves in these situations of despair, of, of hurt. This is especially true as people are dealing with uh, this physical distancing and also dealing with the sickness and yes, even the passing of loved ones. And sometimes it feels like you're going through this deep, dark valley of despair. And it's hurting, it's disconcerting. It sometimes leaves us totally distraught. But this is what we are going through right now. But that's not where we are to stay. We want to try to find out how we get to these loftier peaks of relief, of healing, of recovery, and of hope. And so we go to the outline of the text. The text begins with, hear my cry, O God. Cry, a creaking or shrill sound. That's the literal meaning of the term. 
this cry of this particular psalmist uh, is an open, uh, audible cry. It's not quiet. He's not sitting around sulking. His tears are not to himself. But rather, this is an open, loud cry. Uh, you know, this is the way we first learned how to cry as children. A baby seldom cries a quiet cry. So when this author talks about crying, crying, pouring out his heart, it, it, it's something that, that, uh, that someone else can hear. He can't hold it on the inside. It, it, the, the issue has welled up so much inside of him that it bursts out in, in, in sound. This is what he is going through. Crying as prayer in this case, however, indicates certain conditions. It indicates trouble, distress, and urgency. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Trouble in the sense that there is a problem. This author has a difficulty. And the difficulty is, uh, is distressful. It is causing him stress. It is putting pressure on his life. It is squeezing him in, as it were. But not only is it a problem, and not only is the problem squeezing him, but the problem, the trouble is also urgent. That is to say that there is something wrong and it needs attention right now. This is the reason that he is crying out. He's crying out because he needs attention right now. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we get in a situation where we need attention right now. It can't wait until later in the day. It can't wait until next week. It can't wait until next month. We need the attention right now. And so we cry from the depths of our soul, Lord, help me. God, I need you now. I would also have you to note the uh, brevity of this prayer. And not only of the prayer in this part of the psalm that we are dealing with, but also the, uh, the brevity of the, of the entire psalm. This brevity suggests a kind of informality. That is to say, the psalmist was not trying to uh, stand up in a worship service and give a formal prayer uh, where other worshipers were present. Rather, this is a cry from the depths of his heart. And you know, brothers and sisters, when you really get in trouble, you really don't have time for a lot of formality. You can't fix it where uh, it might sound good to someone else. Rather, what has welled up in your spirit, in your soul, the, the, the burden that has put pressure on you causes you to come out of uh, your being without the formality, without the form, the fashion, without all of the uh, uh, structures that we usually have in a public space. That's the kind of cry this is from this particular author. And the request for God to hear raises a crucial question. That crucial question is this. Does God always here. I have been talking with so many brothers and sisters over the past few days who either have loved ones in the hospital or they've had loved ones to pass away. And although they will not say it to me directly, I can hear the question in, in some of them as they talk with me. Does God really hear me? Does God feel the pain that's in my soul? Does God know how difficult this is I'm going through? Surely some people have said historically, oh, but you can't question God. I would submit that when life really takes a hard turn, when you really feel heavy, when life happens to you and it presents questions and leaves all the answers 
off from the questions. When, when life puts a weight on you that you know you can't bear, you do wonder, God, why? God, what are you doing? I've been calling on you. God, do you hear me? And sometimes what we end up doing is praying the same prayer over and over and over again because it does not feel like to us that God hears us. And so we ask the question, does God always hear us? Psalm 27 and 7 says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Again, the call to hear. Uh, Psalm 39 and 12 says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Once again, we have these psalmists calling upon God to hear. God, come and hear me. Hear me. Hear what I have to say. Hear uh, my, my petition. God, hear what is in the depths of my soul. God, hear my, my, my hurt, my anguish. Uh, the old hymn says, pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Once again, there is a cry for God to hear. God, hear me. Hear me. God, hear me when I am broken. Hear me when I am torn down. Hear me when I am hurt. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, you just want God to hear you and you want to know that God hears you. And so you call out, God, do you hear me? God, can you feel the anguish that is in my soul? God, do you know when I've had enough? This question comes. Does God hear us? And indeed, sometimes we wonder. Psalm 22 and 1, a psalm that, according to Scripture, was quoted by Jesus while he hung on the cross, says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then the other part of that verse says, Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Groaning, groaning. Groaning is, a, is another audible sound that we make at times when brothers and sisters, uh, rational words will not do. We groan, we moan, some people hum, some people sigh. Those are the cries of the spirit. And when those cries coming from the spirit uh, go up and go forth to God, we are at the point where we're about to break, where we don't know what to do. And so we cry, God, have you forsaken me? God, are you still there? God, did you hang up on me? Did you disconnect me, God? Those are the questions that come to us when we are in our deepest and darkest and most painful moments. However, here comes the good news. The fact that this writer calls upon God to hear his cry demonstrates that his faith is truly in God and that he believes that God does hear. Here is the connection. The connection is this, when we feel distraught, broken, when that cry wells up in our spirits and it comes out in an audible way, it is of utmost importance that we call God even if we are asking God whether God is there. Because to ask if God is there in and of itself is an acknowledgement that God is at least somewhere in your spirit. So the idea, brothers and sisters, is that even when we, we question whether God hears us, whether God is there, whether God cares about us, whether God wants to come and see about us, we still must call upon God even in our wondering, even in our 
even in our questioning of God, we have to still affirm, and we do still affirm, that God is there. Never forget that when you wonder whether God is there, it's all right. Go on and ask if God is there. Because once you ask that God is there, you have actually rekindled the God consciousness in your spirit. So it is of utmost importance that we even ask the question. Then this writer says, from the end of the earth, I call to you, that is to you, God, when my heart is faint. Now, this statement provides information about two aspects of this psalmist situation. And I want to show you what these two aspects are, first of all. F first of all, there is a calling from the end of the earth. That's the first aspect of his condition. He says, I'm calling from the end of the earth. Now, this end of the earth can be geographical. It could be that this author is in exile. Uh, he's in, in exile, maybe away from Israel. And because he is in exile away from Israel, he feels as though he's such a long, long, long way from where he desires to be. So he feels as though he's at the end of the earth. You know how it is? All of us know how it is right now. When you cannot get with family, you can't be with family right now. There are members of your family uh, from whom you are, uh, uh, from whom you are, are, are parted. We have all been separated, most of us, from members of our families. We would love to be with them, to hug them, to hold them, but we can't be with them right now. So this author says, I'm praying because I am distant. I am far away. I am literally far away from where I desire to be. There's this geographical distance. That may be his the end of the earth that he is talking about. But brothers and sisters, there's also another way in which we can understand this end of the earth idea. Because one can also be at the end of the earth spiritually. The idea here is that he is in a distant land in his mind and in his spirit. That is to say, he is not where he would like to be. He feels alienated, separated distant on the inside. He might have others present around him, but he still feels disconnected from them uh, internally. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, we can be in a huge crowd. People all around us everywhere, laughing, joking, having a good time. But still, we will feel isolated even in the midst of the crowd. That is to say, we... We want to get into an interaction with other people. But there is as if there is a shield around us, a barrier, as it were. And every time we try to turn to someone and engage someone else, that someone is separated from us by this shield. Sometimes our alienation, our distant land, our end of the earth, as this psalmist puts it, is an internal end of the earth. We are not who we would like to be because we are alienated, separated from who we are. So the first part, the first part of uh, this psalmist prayer, the first aspect that this uh, word tells us is a calling from the end of the earth. Here's the second part. He also calls on God when his heart is faint. The old King James Version says, when his heart is overwhelmed. The Common English Bible says, when his heart is weak. Overwhelmed, weak, faint. The message here, brothers and sisters, is this. There are times when we just can't do anymore. Now, some of us, sometimes don't even realize that. And so we keep going anyway, and then we end up hurting ourselves. But there are those times, there are those moments when you can't do any more work. You can't give any more encouragement. You can't move any further. You can't take any more bad news. You can't 
press on any further. You can't get up anymore. You are just at the point where you are completely overwhelmed. To be overwhelmed is to stand in the face of something that is more powerful than you that is oppressing you. You are overwhelmed. Something comes over you and pushes you down and holds you there. Overwhelmed. Now, I don't know whether anyone who's listening to me tonight has actually felt overwhelmed or not. But I would suspect that many of you have, that you have gotten to the end of your proverbial rope, that you have pressed as hard as you can press and you have no more strength to press. You just can't push it any further. Some of us are going through that right now been hearing and listening to bad news after bad news after bad news and you just can't go anymore. This psalmist tells us, listen, hear and call upon God. Tell God, listen God, I have been struggling, I've been pushing, I've been trying, but I just can't go any further. This is as far as I... God, here I am. This psalmist calls out of his sense of being overwhelmed. And, and this, because he's overwhelmed, he feels faint. In other words, he doesn't have his sense about it. He does not have his balance. To feel faint means that you are losing your balance in life. You can no longer balance things. And so one side of life is overloaded. And the other side of life has no weight on it at all. And so life is not kept in a balance. It's, it's so important to keep life in a balance, not to get too high when things go great and not to get too low when things go bad, but to keep life in a kind of balance. This psalmist felt faint. He was losing his equilibrium. He could not move on any further. He could not walk in a straight line. It, it was as if... Life had caused him to be intoxicated, but intoxicated with trouble, intoxicated with stress. You know, you can have so much stress in your life that it will end up making you inebriated, totally and completely intoxicated, where trouble makes you lose your sense of reasoning. This is where this author was, and this is where we are sometimes. We get to that point, and when you get to that point, it's critical, it's important. He said, God, I'm calling upon you when I'm out of balance, when I don't know which way to go, how to turn, what to do. God, I'm calling upon you right now. That's his call. Then he says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He first of all requests that God would lead him. We may not know the way. That's the reason that we need God to lead us. And we sometimes get lost. So we need God to lead us. Sometimes God operates as our North Star. This is a way in which God might lead us. North Star, what I thought about this uh, analogy. Uh, I thought about one of the uh, great uh, heroines of history, Harriet Tubman, one of the great leaders of the Underground Railroad. I'm sure most many of you uh, know about Harriet Tubman. Uh, she made more than 19 trips back to the land of chattel slavery in order to free more than 300 slaves. She's one of the principal conductors of the so-called Underground Railroad, that system of stops from the en enslavement south to the free north. And she was one of the principal conductors. And as a principal conductor, she earned the name of Moses of her people. Well, as you read about Harriet Tubman and you find out how she made her way from the land of slavery to the, Harriet Tubman did not have any devices whatsoever. She had no device to tell her which way to go. 
But the way in which Harriet Tubman found out how to go is that she could always look at the North Star. And as long as she would check on where the North Star was, she knew which direction to go in. I just stopped by to tell somebody tonight that as long as you check where God is, God will let you know where to go. God can become your North Star to guide you from whatever enslaved condition you have into a condition and a situation of total liberation. That's one image. God might also be our compass. I'll tell you what came to my mind when I thought about a compass. A compass does not uh, tell you where your destination is. A compass does not tell you. The only thing a compass does is point. And if you go in the direction that the compass is pointing, if you understand which way the compass is pointing, then you just move in that direction. Sometimes God does not give us all of the parameters of our direction. Sometimes God just points and said, I want you to go that way. God serves as a kind of compass. God says, now this direction is a good way. That direction is a bad way. You need to go in this direction. That's all the compass does for us. And it's important for us to understand how uh, how God sometimes in our lives acts as a compass, gives us directions, helps us to see what our options are, and then invites us to go in the direction that he desires. Then there was one other uh, idea direction. You knew that I had to come here. Uh, God is our GPS, our global positioning system. Uh, there are a whole lot of things that uh, most of us are familiar with the GPS. Most of us have GPS in our cars, on our phones, everywhere. And the thing about a GPS is this. When you turn it on, you put in your destination, and then it will tell you every turn you need to make. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we don't have the wherewithal to find our way if God just points. God needs to tell us, every, all right, turn, 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 turn right. Okay, it's time to turn left. All right, turn right again. All right, uh-oh, make a U-turn. Then God will have us to make a U-turn sometimes. God, God sometimes has to tell us step by step which way we need to turn. And I'll tell you something about a GPS system. It's a global positioning system. And the reason it's able to do that, most of us realize, is that the signal of where we are goes up to a satellite and the satellite figures out where we're trying to go. And so the satellite connects where we are with where we're going. Y'all didn't hear that. The satellite connects where we are with where we're going. Listen at this carefully. God connects us, connects where we are with where we are trying to go. God already knows where we are trying to go. And just as with the GPS system, every now and then, I don't know about you, but every now and then I'll make a wrong turn. Even with the GPS system, I'll make a wrong turn. And when I make a wrong turn, you know exactly what the GPS system does. It recalibrates. It gives you another right. I'm so glad that when I make a wrong turn, God always has another way for me to get to my destination. And I want to let somebody know that tonight. Sometimes we make wrong turns. Sometimes life causes us to make wrong turns. But God has already connected where you are with where you're trying to go. And let me tell you something. If you keep listening to God, God will get you there. The writer says, lead me to the rock, the rock, the rock, the rock here symbolizes strength, power, stability, divinity. These are some of the uh, biblical images and ideas behind a rock. Uh, back in ancient times, the, the rock was understood as that which was hard, that which was sturdy, that which lasted. So what this particular psalmist is saying 
is that, God, I need you to lead me to something stable. My life is out of kilter right now. It is just as unstable as it can be. So, God, lead me to a place that is stable. God, I'm weak right now. I need to go to a place of strength. God, I'm broken right now. I need to go to a place of wholeness. God, I'm tired right now. I need a sanctuary of rest. Lead me to a rock, a rock, something firm, something I can hold on to, especially in these times of turbulence and turmoil and strife and uncertainty. God, give me something to hold on to. Lead me to a rock, a rock. What kind of rock do I need to go to? The psalmist said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. Huh. I need to go to a rock that's a fortress. A fortress is the idea that, that something has been built around you and it actually protects you from harm. We need some protection. There are times when aspects of this world close in on us to destroy us, we need the rock that is protection, a fortress, a guard against the enemy that would steal all of our joy, all of our happiness, all of our well-being. The 89th Psalmist calls God the rock of my salvation. Here again, we get another image of the rock. This image of the rock suggests that uh, God actually brings us out of our trouble. One has to do with God protecting us from trouble. This psalmist now says that God actually brings us out of our, uh, our uh, distressful predicaments, that God pulls us up from the so-called miry clay, as one psalmist says, that God lifts us when we fall. God uh, snatches us from the dungeons of despair and hurt and pain and disappointment. God is the rock of, and, and because God is called a rock of salvation, that means that God is a sure salvation, a firm salvation, a salvation on which we can count. The Ahimnidus, Augustus, top lady, identified Jesus as the rock of ages. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Uh, the idea behind that song, rock of ages, the hymn writer is referring to Jesus. It says, cleft for me, that is open up for me. Then it says, let me hide myself in thee. In other words, God provide for me a hiding place, a hiding place from my enemy, a hiding place from the pain and the stress that I have to deal with every day. God, every now and then, I just need a little hiding place. God, I'm not going to hide forever. I know that I'll have to come out and face uh, the difficulties of this world from time to time. But God, every now and then, just give me a hiding place. That is the request of that particular song. Then there's a, uh, another uh, hymnodist, Edward Moat, who referred to Jesus as the solid rock. The song says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock, I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Here, the rock is understood more as a foundation, that upon which one can stand. Sometimes as we are moving about from day to day, we come upon ground that is slippery, ground that is muddy. Sometimes we come up on ground that is marshy. 
So this particular songwriter, Moat, says, I'm standing on the solid rock. Jesus uh, told a parable one time. It's at the end of uh, Matthew's uh, Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7 of Matthew. He said, uh, you know what? Uh, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like the man who built his house on a rock. He said, so when the rains fell and when the winds blew, it did not destroy this house. Why? Because it was built on a rock. This is the kind of foundation on which we need to build our lives. Why? Because the rain will fall. The winds will blow. Sometimes even the earth will shake. So it is of utmost importance that we are standing on that which is solid in our life. Brothers and sisters, stand on the solid rock. When all about you is chaotic, when people are losing their minds, losing their composure, Losing their reason. Stand on the rock that is Christ. And when you stand on that rock, you find that you will be able to stand in any kind of environment. The rock. There's an old African-American spiritual that says, Jesus is a rock in a weary land goes on to say, a shelter in the time of a storm. Jesus, the rock, a weary land. Land, of course, the portrait here is of the land of chattel slavery, where people of African descent had been robbed from their home, taken from their homes, robbed of their language and their culture, then put into a situation where they experienced nothing but anguish and pain and difficulty and hurt and doubt. And in the midst of all of that suffering, all of that horror, all of those beatings, all of that humiliation, all of that work with no pay, all of that pain of being separated from loved ones, in the midst of all of that, they could still sing, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. Oh, the land is weary, but I've got a rock on which to stand. They invite us, even as they call us from centuries past, to stand on that rock. What kind of rock do I need? I need a rock that is higher than I. We don't need to go to a rock that's on the same level as we are. We don't need a rock that's going to leave us in the same situation of suffering and doubt and fear and pain and disappointment we need a rock that is higher than we are. One that goes above and beyond our situation. The idea is, is actually this. Uh, you can stay in your various valleys and wrestle with your problems, your hardship, your difficulty all alone. But I came by this evening to let you know and to let you know for sure that there is a God who is ready, willing, and able to lead you to a higher rock. What does that mean at a time like this? It may not mean that every problem that you have will be solved. It may not mean that the problem that the world is going through will instantly be dissolved. 
What it does mean, my brothers and sisters, is that God will lift you up to a spiritual level where you will no longer be torn apart, ripped shred to shred, where your nerves will no longer be stretched and bent out of shape. God will put you in a place that is higher than all of this. Not that you will ignore it, but that you will not be adversely, completely and adversely affected by it. God is ready to lead you to a place. God realizes that it's hard. God understands that we are going through. So what do I do every now and then? When life starts to press in upon me. And yes, life presses in upon me too. When I feel life pressing in upon me, when it feels as though I can't make another step, can't go any further, can't offer another word, can't do anything. When I say, I say, God, put me in a different place so that I can experience the relief that only you can provide. God, get me up out of this doldrum, this rut this hole, this pit. God, pick me up. Set me in a different place. And God, when you set me in a different place, even though the trial and the trouble is still all around, God, I'll be able to better deal with it. God, you will be able to better deal with your issue if you ask God tonight, tonight, God, Lead me to a rock that is higher than I. What are you asking for? You're asking for upward mobility in God. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. We hope that something has been said or done tonight that will inspire you, that will help you along the way. We believe that if you continue to ask God to lead you to a rock that is higher than your current situation, that God will do indeed just when you feel burdened, distressed, pray that prayer. God, lead me to a rock that is higher than I. Maybe there is someone this evening who wishes to give his or her life to God. You want to open up your life and say, yes, God, I want you to come in. We want you to be able to do that on this evening. And so, my brothers and sisters, if you are here and you are listening and you're hearing, we invite you to do just that. You will see on your screen a telephone number and an email address. And you can either call this number or send an email to this email address. The number is 404-844-4282 or zhbc at zionhill.org. We will be looking to hear from you that we may share this God who can lead you to a rock that is higher than your situation. We invite you to do just that. As well, my brothers and sisters, we also want to take this time to urge you to share with us on this coming Friday evening on what we traditionally call Good Friday at 7 p.m. There will be a streaming here and we will have a special time of meditation and prayer and song that you might share with us as well. Please be with us here on Resurrection Sunday morning. Indeed, we are still, brothers and sisters, engaged in practicing physical distancing. So we want everybody to join us on this coming resurrection morning. We're looking forward to seeing you and yours and feeling your spirit as it comes through these various means. May God bless you and may God keep you always. Let us pray. Again, God, we give you thanks for this day and for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. 
We thank you, God, for the ability, for the privilege of calling upon you. God, when we feel overwhelmed, grant now, God, that you will not leave us in the valleys of our hardship, our pain, and our struggle. But rather, oh God, that you would lead us to a higher place, a more lofty place, a place, God, that is higher than where we are. We bless you. We praise you. We honor you. We magnify your holy and righteous name. And we ask it now in the name of Jesus. Amen.